please, let's welcome Professor Rafael Gonzalo Marcos. Thank you so much. I mean, it's a great pleasure. I mean, it's an honor to be back in Cornell. Uh, first and foremost, I think this is going to be a conversation we're going to have today. Um, I don't want this to be a formal lecture. I want this to be more of a conversation. So, first and foremost, I want to thank Gerardo Negron. I want to thank his colleagues at La Visión Latinoamericana. I want to thank Professor Vilma Santiago Ibizardi, who has been my mentor and friend for so many years. And uh, the Latin American Studies Program, the Latino Studies Program, obviously for sponsoring such a, such a great event. I mean, it's simply a privilege to be back far above Cayugas' borders. <laughs> and some of you might not know that I came to Cornell as a freshman in the fall of 1992 a few months before the day of takeover. Having just finished high school in Puerto Rico that summer, I came to the College of Arts and Sciences, actually not knowing what to expect, not at all certain how this adventure would turn out to be. My first real encounter with Cornell was on August 20th, 1993, when I think Gustavo was just a few months old. <laughs> when my father and I drove from the Syracuse airport late that night, only to find a deserted town and a rundown single room on the fourth floor of Clara Dixon Hall. A very promising. And yet, ever since that day, Cornell really changed my life. And in particular, the people I found here made all the difference. People like Vilma, Tom Holloway, Fred Leach, Peter Katzenstein, Mary Roldan, Margaret Washington, Frank Rhodes, Hunter Rollins, the folks at the Latino Studies Program, Marty Dennis, Akosef, who doesn't exist anymore, but did then, people like Rick Medina Akosef, people like Dean Lee Nabel, the College of Arts and Sciences, who was the person in charge of the College Scholar Program, of which I benefited so greatly. People in the career services at Barnes Hall, who supported my application to the Marshall Scholarships, and uh, in the end led me to earn a doctorate in history from Oxford. I couldn't have asked for more. So from then on, my whole outlook on critical thinking and writing changed forever. And this explains why I am here once again. I want to engage with you in a dialogue of ideas about one of the subjects that's closest to my heart, and that is the sociological and political constitutional condition of Puerto Rico. How can I change the slides? Let's see. I mean, as, as, as you guys must know, most of you must know, Puerto Rico today is facing the most difficult the most ferocious economic meltdown in its modern history. And it's not surprising then that not since the days when General Nelson Miles led the US invasion of Puerto Rico in 1898 has the island received as much media coverage from American media outlets as it does today. Not even the 1950 attempt on President Truman, the footsteps of the Blair House in Washington, at the hands of Puerto Rican nationalists in 1950, has garnered as much attention from the media mainland, and the mainland's media, as Puerto Rico's current financial meltdown. The picture my dear friends, right now is bleak indeed. And all available economic indicators confirm it. By 2012, real gross national product, GNP, has shrunk, had shrunk by 10%, returning to its 2005 level. 
GMP per capita, moreover, is roughly $15,000, about one-third of the level on the U.S. mainland. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, between January 2013 and June 2014, Puerto Rico has lost 35,873 net jobs. Unemployment in the island is persistently higher than in any of the 50 states or the District of Columbia, edging close to the 16% mark in recent years. While the Labor Participation Index has recently fluctuated between 38 and 41%, it is definitely among the lowest in the world. Puerto Rico's chronic incapacity to generate jobs at home and to successfully compete in the global labor market is the most eloquent demonstration that the island's institutional repertoire is fundamentally broken. A decade of negative growth has led to widespread poverty, pervasive migration, to insurmountable levels of public debt. Close to 45% of Puerto Ricans live in poverty, twice as many as in Mississippi. 38% are on food stamps, three times as many as in the mainland. Not surprisingly, these conditions have led to a massive exodus, not seen since the days of Operation Bootstrap in the 1950s. Puerto Rico's population has come down from 3.8 million in the year 2000 to 3.6 million in 2012. Between the year 2000 and 2012, 141,000 people have left the island. In the last two years alone, Puerto Rico has lost 59,000 residents, or 1.5% of its population. And to make matters worse, those who are living are precisely the ones we need the most. Young, like you guys, well-educated, productive mm -hmm. professionals, as you will surely become, in their prime, who cannot survive at home. This brain drain is undoubtedly one of the crisis' most tragic phenomena. The third largest municipal bond issuer in the U.S., after New York and California, Puerto Rico has long enjoyed unencumbered access to the markets, doing no small measure to its bonds high yields and triple exemption from federal, state, and local taxes. Yet, negative growth, together with uncontrolled de deficit financing policies, have led to unmanageable levels of public debt. According to the GDB, that's the Puerto Rico, Development Bank. As of May 31st, 2014, the total outstanding public debt of the island, meaning the central government, the municipalities, together with the public corporations, amounts to $72.6 billion, which is equivalent to approximately 103% of our GNP. The deficits have become so pervasive Short-term financing and liquidity sources have become so scarce, and the possibility of a default so real that, uh, that by February 2014, the credit rating agencies depraved the Commonwealth General Obligation Bonds and the Commonwealth Guarantee Bonds to non-investment grade, known as junk status. And soon thereafter, in July 2014, many of you know, the Commonwealth ratings were further lowered by each of the credit agencies two notches into junk. As we speak, the possibility of the Commonwealth defaulting on its 72 billion debt is a clear and present danger, due in no small measure to the GDP's absence of liquidity and to its overextended obligations. Now, this is what I'm going to say now. It's very important, and I want you guys to take it home with you and to analyze this. I mean, contrary to what happened in Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Cyprus, 
Puerto Rico won't be paid out by the U.S. Treasury and or the Federal Reserve. The federal, at least the political branches of the U.S. government, they have made it plain clear, at least at this stage, that they are not considering a bailout of Puerto Rico. Okay, so mean, that means that the repertoire of potential solutions available to Puerto Rico are limited. And that really means that there is a big challenge in terms of what to do and the sort of creative mechanisms that we should be trying to negotiate and push forward in Washington in order for us to actually get out from this economic malaise. Now, for Rico's economic meltdown, and this is, again, this is another fundamental point. I mean, on the one hand, the European approach to the fiscal crisis in most, in, uh, in most of the big European economies is not going to be superimposed to the Puerto Rican scenario. Okay? And the other important thing I want you guys to realize is that the Puerto Rican crisis, the Puerto Rican economic crisis has a huge potential impact on U.S. markets because uh, Puerto Rico represents today perhaps the most perhaps the most important issuer of debt in the American municipal debt market. Okay, the American municipal debt market is valued at $4.3 trillion. It's the market that the 50 states and over 19,000 cities across America uses to, to finance their uh, capital projects and to finance their operations. I mean, if you have a jurisdiction like Puerto Rico uh, that basically sells uh, bonds across the board and basically 75% of the newly bond funds across America are invested in Puerto Rico paper. What do you think is going to happen in Puerto Rico defaults? Obviously, that's going to have a ripple effect, and that's going to destabilize one of the most important capital markets here in the mainland. Okay? So that's one of the tools, I mean, that's one of the per persuasive tools that Puerto Rico has to engage the political branches in Washington. I mean, it's in your best interest, and it's in our best interest that we sit down and negotiate the restructuring, not just of the economic relationship, but fundamentally of the political constitutional arrangement. And that's the argument I'm going to put to you today. Now, as I'm saying, from this gigantic fiscal crisis, however, comes forth a great opportunity not just for economic restructuring, but equally importantly for political constitutional re-engineering. It is no secret, as the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the General Accountability Office, and the White House Task Force on Puerto Rico's status all have come close at hinting. Puerto Rico's economic crisis is a reflection of a wider and equally pervasive political constitutional meltdown. And I want you to pay attention to the following. In June 2012, just five months before the election in Puerto Rico, in a sort of unprecedented move, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York rendered a report on the Puerto Rican economy competitiveness, or lack thereof. Okay. And in July 2014, just perhaps six weeks ago, they updated that 2012 report. Okay. And that goes to show, first of all, the mere fact that they devoted time to analyzing the Puerto Rican conundrum means that obviously the Puerto Rican situation has a potential great impact in American capital markets. Okay. And most importantly, however, the conclusions and the recommendations the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is making are recommendations that go beyond the economic. They address the political aspects of Puerto Rico's current relationship with the US and goes to basically the report and the update that was 
as I say, rendered perhaps six weeks ago, basically challenges the whole notion that the political arrangement is satisfactory. Basically saying that because of the political arrangement, because of the fact that Congress controls all the economic triggers that impact the Puerto Rican economy, ranging from environmental regulation, communication regulation, uh, labor regulations, even shipping regulations, the fact that there's unilateral control in Congress of those variables is actually making Puerto Rico's economic upliftment virtually impossible because we have no say in the policies that are currently put in place to address the Puerto Rican situation. I mean, the Puerto Rican government really has no authority in terms of driving economic policy. I mean, that's the fundamental problem here. I mean, there's no, cons I mean, there's no concerted dialogue going on between our authorities, local authorities in Puerto Rico, and the political branches in Washington because the political constitutional repertoire, the relationship as it stands today, really doesn't serve well and doesn't promote well Puerto Rico's interest, nor does it promote well the United States interests as a global superpower. Now, the perpetuation of a neo-colonial relationship with Washington, and I think that's no secret, a relationship that unilaterally imposes on the Commonwealth weak economy all the regulatory costs of the world's strongest economy, along with values, and this is very important, along with values of over-dependency, has no doubt exacerbated the triggers behind the meltdown making it even harder for Puerto Rico to overcome an endogenous economic depression in a weakened global economy. Furthermore, the island's present condition doesn't serve well the people of Puerto Rico. And as I just argued, it certainly doesn't promote Washington's geopolitical interests in the Western Hemis Hemisphere either. I mean, have you guys, I know you're young, but uh, perhaps if I ask Vilma and Fred, they might be able to perhaps point us in the right direction. But I mean, did you guys ever imagine that the Russian president would go and fly into Havana and then go to Managua and then go and meet Dilma Rousseff in, in Brazil and then go off to Buenos Aires and meet Cristina Fernandez and that the Chinese president all of a sudden has a lot of allies in the region and that the Chinese are financing this super inter oceanic canal in Nicaragua, and that the Chinese were the ones who basically financed the refurbishment of the Panama Canal. Could you have imagined that? Perhaps not, certainly not me. I'm a child of the Cold War. And the, there has been a weakening presence of the US and its alliances in the region, and I think that to the extent that the United States neglects its moral responsibilities in Puerto Rico, it really uh, undercuts its own prestige in the region, I believe. And, and it goes to show that, that the Puerto Rican uh, conundrum really has a ripple effect that transcends the bilateral Puerto Rico-US relationship. It's not just a, a, a linear uh, conundrum or jigsaw puzzle. It's a very complicated jigsaw puzzle that has a lot of different uh, sides to it. Now, so what does the future hold for approaching Puerto Rico's status question, both procedurally and substantive, substantively? What are the next steps? Well, procedurally, as you may know, the ball is right now at least in theory, in Puerto Rico's court. President Obama signed an appropriations bill on January 17, and basically, pursuant to that bill, Congress has assigned 2.5, it's a meager figure, really, I mean, $2.5 million for voter education and a plebiscite on status options that, and I quote, are not incompatible with the Constitution and laws and policies of the U.S. End of quote, as defined 
by the Department of Justice in Washington. So that, again, that goes into question the legitimacy of any sort of self-determination exercise that basically provides for the unilateral veto of one of the negotiating partners. That aside, the island's political leadership must now decide how to approach the administration's latest move without losing sight of the fact that the statutory language passed by Congress leaves Congress basically off the hook yet again. It doesn't bind Congress in any way to honor the will of the people of Puerto Rico. The administration's suggested procedural path, moreover, is at odds with the campaign pledge made to the people of Puerto Rico by the island's governing party during the 2012 election cycle for the convening of a constitutional convention in the event Congress failed to pass a self-executing status bill during 2013. This is something that you should also pay attention to. There is a, a growing consensus in Puerto Rico, across party lines, that the most effective way, the only way to engage Congress and to force Congress to sit down and negotiate with Puerto Rico a way out to this whole crisis is by means of us in Puerto Rico convening a constitutional convention. <clears throat> okay? A constitutional convention that basically engages Congress on behalf of the people of Puerto Rico. A constitutional convention that's convened for that specific purpose and that's going to be deliberating regardless of the local electoral timetable. I mean, the whole idea here is to extricate from local politics status discussions. And we believe that the only, the most effective way of doing this is by way of a constitutional convention. Because that brings forth the full authority of the people, and it gives a mandate okay, to the delegates to negotiate with the Congress, while the local politicians keep doing their thing and, 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 and governing the country. You have these other people who are actually negotiating a new political constitutional package for the island. Okay? And obviously, whatever they decide and negotiate has to go back to the people, obviously, in a referenda or, or future plebiscites. Now, that's the pledge the governing party in Puerto Rico made when we ran for office and I ran for resident commissioner in the 2012 elections uh, on behalf of the, of, the, of the current governing party in Puerto Rico. The pledge we made to the people of Puerto Rico was that unless, okay, unless in 2013 legislation was passed in Congress self-executing legislation was passed in Congress, which didn't happen, that we would support a constitutional convention as the only procedural mechanism for actually addressing the Puerto Rican situation. And you know why? Why does a growing consensus behind the constitutional convention mechanism? It's not a new mechanism. I mean, Eugenio Maria de Hostos, in 1899, just after the invasion, he proposed holding a constitutional convention. Pedro Aviso Campos, later in 1930, proposed a constitutional convention. Luis Muñoz Marín, in 1943, proposed holding a constitutional convention. In, the, in 1970, pursuant to El Pronunciamiento de Aguajuena, the Partido Popular Democrático, the PDP, also suggested holding a constitutional convention. So this idea has been going around for decades, for many, many years. And right now, in the 21st century, it has taken hold again of a sizable proportion of the Puerto Rican political movements because there's something I'm sure you have learned already in your government classes. And that is, Congress doesn't act unless it's forced to act. Empires don't act on the, they have no other choice. The Puerto Rico topic will never be at the top of the agenda of any administration. There's always going to be a crisis. There's always going to be another issue. What's going on right now? 
What's the new excuse right now? ISIS, Syria, the Ukraine, Crimea, even Scotland. What to do with the potential disintegration of the transatlantic trans -Atlantic partner, for instance? I mean, there's always going to be very thorny issues at the top of the totem pole. Puerto Rican issue has to be forced by the people of Puerto Rico to become an important issue that needs to be addressed. The only way of doing this is by coming up with new techniques, new strategies. And the Constitutional Convention, in my estimation, is that new strategy that hasn't been used before, but that's perhaps the most robust tool that we might have at our disposal to actually force Congress to make some very tough choices. And one of the tough choices Congress has to make is to tell to the people of Puerto Rico explicitly whether they're willing or not to admit Puerto Rico as a state. They should openly delineate which are the burdens of statehood, for instance. What are the economic, sociological, cultural, linguistic conditions Do you need a 90% majority, as in Alaska and Hawaii? Are you going to impose, for instance, like in New Mexico and other places, English as the official language? What's going to happen with the debt that Puerto Rico has? Are you going to basically assume the debt of Puerto Rico? Or will Puerto Rico have to shoulder its own debt and on top of that, bear the burdens of, in a way, subsidizing and, and, and sending sizable proportion of its own budgets to support the federal government. I mean, those are very tough choices, and tough questions that Congress needs to decide. Now, from the point of view of independence or a free association relationship, Congress also needs to make very tough choices. And Congress must be forced to make those tough choices. For instance, are we going to have double citizenship? under a free association relationship. Are the unborn going to be U.S. citizens under the same conditions that U.S. citizenship is granted pursuant to the current scenario? What's going to happen with the security of Puerto Rico, national defense, foreign affairs? What's the economic package for the financing of any sovereign Puerto Rico? What's going to be the legal relationship between the Puerto Ricans in the mainland and the Puerto Ricans in the island in a sovereignty model? I mean, those are tough questions. Are we going to have free transit like the Filipinos and the Samoans? The Samoans have had since 1889, but the Filipinos had between 1898 and 1946. I mean, these are the sort of Thorny questions that no one is talking about, but these are the questions that really define the future of our relationship. And the only way to push Congress to actually make these choices, in my estimation, is not by engaging in yet a fifth local plebiscite that's not binding on Congress, by wasting our time and our budgets on illusory uh, plebiscite, but by actually convening a constitutional convention. Now, with no consensus in sight as regards process, because as I told you, the current administration in Puerto Rico has voiced its intention of actually calling for yet a fifth local plebiscite that's not binding on Congress, which I believe is a mistake of historical proportions. Let's go to the, perhaps, to the thorny issue of substance, okay? And when we talk about substance, I'm not going to discuss the statehood uh, proposition. I'm not going to discuss the independence proposition and the challenges <coughs> facing the independence party and the challenges facing the new progressive pro statehood party. But I want to focus uh, on one of the more complex, perhaps, the most complex issue besieging the Puerto Rican landscape 
really is how to bring about ideological clarity to the PDP's pro-commonwealth camp. More so than arriving at a mutually agreeable understanding with Congress on the specifics behind statehood for independence, I believe this has become by far a more elusive and yet more problematic proposition because without a doubt, and this is very important, without a doubt, the PDP's ideological crisis has become an albatross around the neck of any plausible path for undoing the status not. Senator Ron Wyland's admonition at the most recent status hearing before the U.S. Senate's Committee of Energy and Natural Resources, held on August 1, 2013, deserves particular attention. I want you to, to think about this statement. And he says the following, two out of three, meaning two out of three of you, seem to believe that the current status and enhanced commonwealth are no longer options. They are no longer options on the table. Two out of three of you. So looking forward, and this was at the end of the hearing, okay? it's a kind of an admonition. So looking forward, it seems to me that it's especially important to see if the three of you can come to an agreement on the language of a ballot that in effect has two remaining options, statehood or sovereignty, as an independent or freely associated state. Absent an agreement of the three of you, it seems that this will just go round and round some more. End of quote. The Commonwealth camp must urgently come to grasp with this inescapable reality. Only a relationship premised along the lines of a free association model, whereby the U.S.'s political branches transfer to Puerto Rico the powers of sovereignty acquired by the U.S. over the island under the terms of the Treaty of Paris will enable the so-called enhancement that for too long has eluded Puerto Rico's autonomous movement. None of the PDP's historic claims for so-called enhancement of Commonwealth, first one to which Puerto Rico would enjoy certain attributes normally associated with sovereign nations, such as deciding on the applicability of federal legislation, authority to participate in international organizations, and to enter in its own right into international agreements, power to regulate commerce among Puerto Rico, the U.S., and foreign countries, authority to levy increase or reduce tariffs and quotas, none of those historical aspirations are possible under the current arrangement whereby sovereignty remains in the hands of Congress. Okay? And that's the crux of the matter here. The fundamental issue going forward is, is sovereignty going to be in the hands of the people of Puerto Rico, or is sovereignty going to be in the hands of Congress? That's it. That's it. Now, the two questions that immediately arise are, I mean, in light of this, and in light of the fact that since the days of the Eisenhower presidency, and if you look at all the attempts at, at enhancing Commonwealth status, Fair Nostrum Bill 1959, the Aspinall Bill 1963, the Compact of Permanent Union, 1975, the Johnston Bills in the Senate, 1989, they have all founded. In light of that, the two questions that immediately arise are, why has the PDP leadership shied away from taking to task the obvious failings of its ideological construct? And more importantly, what is the relevance of this debate to the overall question of the future status of Puerto Rico? Now, it is essential to note, and for you, maybe some of you guys might be in the government department, those of you who want to write a good paper with a good mentor like Vilma, perhaps, they should uh, take, take, to, take to heart the following and scrutinize the following statement I'm going to make. Okay? 
It is essential to note for, that for the most part, Puerto Rico's West Commonwealth movement has always sought intellectual refuge in European notions of autonomy and dual sovereignties. Available in, for instance, the 1897 Autonomic Charter, the 1931 Statute of Westminster, the 1954 Charter for the Kingdom of the Netherlands, as amended in 2010, due to St. Martin's and Curacao's accession to status of Arctic, the 2009 Greenland Self-Government Act, and even the European Union treaties, among other European legal instruments. Notions that as a matter of US public policy have been for the most part unavailable to Puerto Rico and to any other special jurisdiction under the American flag, particularly following the demise of the Indian treaty system, and the hyper-federalization of U.S. governance in the post-civil rights movement age. Okay? And that's very, very, very important. Second, notions of sovereignty, particularly at the heyday of the Cold War, and to a lesser degree, more recently, have tended to be devalued in Puerto Rico. So that has to do with the historic, obviously the historic, um, uh, inquisition that was led prior to the McCarthy era, really, Puerto Rico, and obviously during the McCarthy era and afterwards, against any sort of movement that that put forward a, a sovereignty proposition. But also, local politicians have always, local politicians and some local politicians uh, within the own, within the PDP itself and other movements have historically shied away from proposing uh, sovereignty models, models of sovereignty, out of fear that the electorate might, all of a sudden, uh, enter in panic, that they might lose U.S. citizenship for the unborn, or that they might lose access to, to federal benefit programs. Uh, and that type of, of fear-mongering campaigns, they have have a toll in the Puerto Rican debate. Now things are changing. And uh, the ideological posture within the autonomous camp is swiftly evolving. The obvious realities the economic meltdown has sought to bear, together with the realization that clinging on to the territorial practices leads nowhere, is enabling, at the moment, as we speak, the flourishing of inter-party alliances favoring a compact premise on Puerto Rican sovereignty. To the extent the ideological decolonization of Puerto Rico's less autonomous movement fully comes to life, the people of Puerto Rico will finally have, as Senator Wyden says, real choices before him. In the final analysis, the principles of ordered liberty and fundamental fairness upon which the American Republic was founded allow no other outcome than plodding along a transparent and legitimate process of self-determination leading to a dignified non-colonial and non-territorial relationship between the people of Puerto Rico and the U.S. premise, obviously, on Puerto Rico's sovereignty. Thank you so much. <laughs>